everybody, Zach Dewhurst here. We're going to give our attendees just a couple of minutes to file in. Um, with us today is Eric Campbell. Um, Eric is the embroidery guru. He travels to a lot of trade shows throughout the year, does a lot of writing. Um, it's kind of safe to say there are very few, if any, people who know more about embroidery than Eric, and he is the optimal person, uh, our guest, that we could have um, to guide a print shop who's thinking about bringing embroidery in-house. So um, again, we're gonna give our attendees another minute and then we will kick off today's webinar and try not to go an hour and 45 minutes long like I did last week because that's too long. You, you're far too kind, but I'm certainly happy to share what I can. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, I've read a lot of articles written by you. Um, now, if I just applied everything as I read it, I would have saved myself a lot of time. If I could remember and apply everything I wrote, it would probably make me better too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I help other people with their websites and so forth, but I completely ignore my own. My, my this is, everybody asks me, I get this all the time while people are filing in, uh, why isn't your hat embroidered? Yeah, I, it's one of those <laughs> things you're like, you're right. <laughs> you are correct. And usually I, I, I would be with you on that if I were advertising something. <laughs> yeah. But yes, you're correct. I don't do a lot of embroidery for myself. <laughs> I do find it funny. I don't, I, I own a print shop, an embroidery shop, yet I don't like, I like a plain shirt. And it's funny when you walk around the trade show, I see like Ryan from Ryanette. It's a blank mm -hmm. t-shirt. You know, screenprinting.com. Yeah. Why yeah. would you print on something? <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of us see so much of it that I always told people it's like a tattoo if you're a designer. Uh, boy, if you're a designer, you get a tattoo and later on your tastes change or you did something you don't like. Later on, you're just going to look at the thing and hate it. That's why I don't have any. I always want to. I think about it. I don't think I could ever make it happen because I would just stare at it. <laughs> Looking for the corrections, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. What do you say we kick it off, Eric? Absolutely. All right, everybody. This week's webinar is on a print shop's guide to bringing embroidery in-house. Um, again, my name is Zach Dewhurst. I'm the Deco Network Business Development Manager. And with us this week is Eric Campbell. How's it going, Eric? Uh, going all right. Eric, let's just dive into it. How does that sound? Sounds, sounds great. I'm always here to talk shop. Again, our goal of today's webinar is to educate the shops that don't currently have embroidery in-house and are thinking about it and don't really know what all they're going to be getting themselves into. And we can give a little bit of an overview and um, kind of help set them up for success or at least give them a guide of, of what to expect. So first, we're going to talk about digitizing and how that affects the quality of the finished product. Yeah. how stabilizers and backing influence the, the product, how we can properly hoop a product, um, the yeah. different types of thread types and weight, thread tension, mm -hmm. needle types and sizes, and sewing speed. So there's obviously more than just what you see on the screen currently, but if you respect these variables and you pay attention and get them right, um, you will be on the right track to putting out a high quality embroidered product. Yeah, so. it's uh, the one thing to think, it's very holistic. You can't really kick too many legs out from under this thing before it falls over. So you have to really pay attention to all the variables going in. Well, and, and just like with something like screen printing, you have a lot of variables and maybe you change one to get you closer, but then you created a whole nother problem somewhere else. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, they're all connected. I don't care if you have the best digitizing, the best backing. If you pro improperly hoop it or you're using the wrong thread, wrong needle, yeah. hey, you're not going to get the results you want. And um, hopefully we can help um, some shops avoid some of the learning curve mistakes that you know we made in my shop. Because I, sure. for years, outsourced embroidery, brought it in-house, and I thought, I'll just pay for quality digitizing. <laughs> I'll get a mighty hoop and be able to do it and voila, we're good to go. It wasn't until we made a lot of mistakes that we really started to learn 
hey, you should be using a different needle type and size. You need to slow down that sewing yeah. speed. Um, so let's start with digitizing. Um, sure. So, Eric, I mean, it's interpreting a design into embroidery, right? Because when yeah. somebody gets to a file, I mean, it's it's just a flat image, whether it's a vector, a bitmap, sure. but it's not like something we push print or we separate colors to burn screens for screen printing. Explain to us what all goes into digitizing. Well, the thing is, digitizing is very physical. We're dealing with a physical medium. Needles are a set size. Thread is a set width and a set thickness. And we have a lot of distortion that happens uh, on the machine. There's a natural pull where any column of, say, satin stitches will get narrower as it runs. And, and also that same column of satins will get taller as it runs. So where there's a lot of distortion that goes on. But the first part of this is literally that some elements don't work as well at the minimum sizes or maximum sizes that embroidery can run. There's a smallest size that text can run very well in a satin stitch with 40 weight thread, which is the standard about five millimeters. So text under that's going to be problematic. Uh, there are certain lengths of stitches. Once an area gets too long, you can't use a satin stitch in it. We have to start using a different stitch type. These things are all part of the interpretation and a digitizer makes these educated choices about what's going to work best for that, not only the sizes, but the material that's involved because that also gets into how the thing runs. So digitizing is not just conversion. It's looking at a file and saying at the size, that it's going to be on the material that it's going to be what can i do to make the best embroidery and honestly there's another layer of it that's artistic you get textures and the reflection of light on the thread and layering and sequencing all have to go into it so it is really interpretation not just conversion and and when we you're working with the digitizer or you're doing it in-house like you said you need to take into account what the uh, product material is going to be sewn the type of material um, obviously, they're looking at the size of the design yeah. um, and, and all of these variables will determine, you know, where, how many types of stitches exactly. um, yeah. actually sew that design on the machine. Otherwise, the machine won't know how to recreate that design. Um, yeah, uh, by the time it's a machine file, that's just coordinates that tell the needle where to go and drop stitches. In between there, there's a whole different file that's made where a digitizer outlines the different areas and instructs them how they should be filled with stitches, where they start and end, and also the sequence in which they'll sew, both layering and literally in direction. So all of that's chosen by a digitizer and has to be done separately from the art itself. Um, something else we're gonna, another webinar I'm hoping to do down the mm -hmm. uh, road is the color reel and how that yeah. that's been above a machine works and how that throws out a lot of concepts. Um, would agree Change, yeah it changes digitizing even for those of us who've done it forever it changes a lot um really cool technology again we're going to do yeah so on a different webinar um something that's becoming kind of popular it's really popping up um here mm -hmm. more about is auto digitizing um it's in the infancy stage wouldn't you agree eric it's not really totally there yet it can't be totally yeah. trusted for actual sewing if it's yeah. used for mock-up or an estimation of stitches that's definitely yeah. in play but are you going to get think it's the best the result? Result thing. yeah yeah i agree right. with you the, be the best results are probably done by an artistic digitizer who's actually making those choices for you um auto digitizing on very simple things can work to the point of sewing but i mean very simple if we have lots of detail uh, especially we start doing, working at small scales where there are choices made to remove detail that even though it's present in the art Auto digitizing can't make those calls. So it's evolving, it has gotten better, but you're right. Uh, using it as a stitch estimator is probably a far more useful thing to do than to assume that you can put any art into an auto digitizer and get out a quality file. Well, and if it doesn't know what type of product it's going on or if it's going on a hat or a flat, I mean, there's there's, there's variables it's just not accounting for necessarily. Yeah. But then, Time will tell. I mean, everything's getting better, especially with artificial intelligence. Yeah, um, yeah. Misconception, I think, um, a lot of shops don't take into account when they're when they're starting to offer embroidery, whether they're doing it in house or not, is that you don't just pay to have it digitized, and that file works on any type of product or can be stretched. It's it's not like a vector 
where it can just yeah. be scaled from a left chest to a full back, and all of a sudden you're you're good to go. Um, has to essentially be redigitized or digitized differently, right, Eric? Yeah, though there are certainly the ability with the original file the digitizer makes in the original software they made it in, they can do some scaling. However, massively different choices are made between a left chest size and a jacket back size, and they really won't look good even if you attempted to do it. Only the, the simplest, simplest pieces, and even then, things like the compensation settings, the stuff we talked about earlier about things getting narrower and taller, those things will be very different. And literally, you'll make different decisions about what gets included. Certain designs are so detailed that when you make them very small, they won't fit in the threads there. You won't want to put those needle penetrations there, and you remove details. You take that very low detail version and scale it up, the details are just not there. Uh, you can't just scale them uh, infinitely. People like to give you percentages like, oh, within 25%, it's fine. Matter, it entirely depends on the design itself and what's in the design. So yeah, thinking of it like a vector file, even though there are vector-like elements in digitizing software, is not the right call. Um, ma massive changes in size and even just significant changes in size from maybe cap to a center front or a yoke might be enough to cause somebody to make different decisions about what they use for the stitches and the detail. Makes sense. I mean, it's you yeah. know, vectors are using geometry. And yeah. Prize files are not. Um, yeah. Caps are digi uh, digitized differently than a product that is sewn flat. Um, again, yeah. another misconception. You can't just digitize a uh, design that is that'll work in size, you know, based mm -hmm. as a left chest and across a hat. Um, yeah. It may fit, but they are digitized differently because flat products are sewn flat. Whereas a hat is round. So yeah. what the strategy, you know, can you can explain kind of how sure. that works? Yeah, uh, we usually say it's a digitized uh, center out and bottom up. And the being the reason being that cats are, uh, caps are fairly unstable and they're on a cylindrical drive, as you said. They w turn in a cylinder. And what ends up happening if you try and stitch from the left side all the way to the right is a, a wave of material is kind of pushed in front of the presser foot, which is the part that comes down and tamps down the material. So if we're talking print shops, you may not know that. As that foot tamps down and it's pushing that material down and the needle's going in, there's a wave of material that'll build up and it'll literally fold over. You'll create folds or puckers in the cap. So what we do is almost like a tablecloth. We spread it out from the center out. We run to one side and then the other, and it spreads that material out and it keeps it from uh, bundling up or getting those ripples. So caps being kind of unstable, we work for that most stable part, which is right where it attaches to the brim. And we work out from there in order to create that stability and avoid all those ripples and puckers. And it can cause registration errors from color to color. Well, and, and when you do get something digitized, it's a good idea to let the digitizer know, not just that you're doing a cap, but is it a six panel, a five panel? Because, sure. um, I mean, a five panel, there is no center seam that comes in the middle. Mm -hmm. A six panel, I mean, oh my gosh, some of those FlexFit or Richardson or New Era yeah. are really nice hats, but it is the thickest seam in the middle. And that needle comes right down in the center. It can be a yep. nightmare versus if it's just off to the side, it allows it to start creating the stability until you do go right in the middle. Um, Absolutely, and and frankly, that kind of stuff, knowing exactly what it's going on, knowing this the size that you hope for it to be, a digitizer may come back and kind of help you with that if it's not a size that's possible. Uh, knowing that stuff, the more information your digitizer can get from you, the better off it is. Can some designs run on multiple materials? Of course, it's it's not that you have to have a design for every single thing. But for extreme changes, uh, it's really good for the digitizer to know, and definitely the difference between caps and flats. If you must choose one, a cap design is more likely to run on a shirt than a shirt design on a cap, but it will be less efficient. So that's the thing. You will end up doing a lot more color changes and moving around. So if you absolutely must, you don't have time and you have one file that's coming or you have one file on hand, the cap file running on the flat is probably going to run better than the other way around. That makes sense. And and what I've learned is a lot of the digitizers, they don't charge you like a whole nother setup fee typically. Yeah. They'll, they'll just charge you a little bit more to alter it um, for that other type of product that it's being sold. Mm. So the question becomes, Eric, do you do it in-house or do you outsource <laughs> it? And, and um, the reasons why you might do it in-house is one, you have that technical control. You know, you can yeah. throw something, make a quick change and... Um, hope for a better result, um, mm. creative control, right? Um, yeah, and, and yeah, certainly. 
um, another reason is the turnaround speed. You know, I, you, you get a file, if you have in-house digitizing software, you can quickly um, digitize it and again, get it specifically to what you need, test it, uh, make sure you're getting those best possible results versus outsourcing. Um, it takes time to master this skill. It's like opening Adobe Photoshop for the first time or Illustrator. You're not going to master it overnight. It has a nice little bit of a learning curve. Um, now, obviously, there's different types of digitizing software, some that are more sure. powerful than others, have a bigger learning curve. But it is a skill, and it, it takes time to get good at it. The software isn't cheap. A lot of the time, I know, again, there's some cheaper ones and more expensive, but still costs money. And the opportunity cost. Anytime yeah. that you are working on something, you can't be working on something else. Um, so you're not selling, you're not marketing, you're working um, on the actual file. Now, again, maybe you have a team and, and one of your employees can be doing it, but again, you're preventing them from doing something else. So... Um, yeah, there, there's reasons to bring it in-house, reasons to outsource it. What I have learned over the past 15 years, Eric, is that it has gotten a lot cheaper to outsource digitizing, and it's done a lot quicker than it once was. I mean, it's just sure. the evolution of the internet and so forth. Um, my biggest complaint about digitizing, and Eric, I don't know, you probably get these too. Sure. But three, four times a day, you get an email from somebody saying, I can, I can digitize for you. I mean, it just, you get bombarded uh, in our industry. Oh, it's hard because the thing, I also hear the quality concerns. And the truth is, if you're using over, overseas companies, um, you don't know which of their many digitizers you're getting any given day. Yes. And yep. so you may or may not, somebody will tell me, oh, I love X company. I'm not going to name any names, but I love X company. But every, you know, every five designs is terrible. And I'm like, well, yeah, you got the new guy this day because you're not dealing directly digitizer. In there. Yes. And it happens. It happens. But what I'll say is this. Um, you just have to know your market. For us, the last company that I really digitized in-house for, one of the things we did was doing development of designs with people, uh, often who had a lot of uh, artistic things they needed from us. I did a lot of TVs and movies when they were filming out here in New Mexico. So I did a lot of like very quick turnaround with people who had a lot of creative demands and wanted to do, you know, sometimes it would be like, we're here at noon, we need to shoot at five. Can you get us six patches out? There is no kind of outsource digitizing that's going to make that happen. I just had to get my butt in the chair and make this thing go. You know, that's what had to happen. But we charged immense amounts of money for that. Like that cost a lot for them and they were fine to pay it. So it makes sense for that market. And it made sense also. I developed a lot of e-commerce properties where we did a lot of not only creative control, but brand control. We were making sure I made custom fonts for them so that everything was exactly according to their brands. And then we built out entire company stores. That kind of stuff makes great sense for in-house. Otherwise, if you've got a normal turnaround time, most business business places, there's nothing wrong with deciding to outsource. And I know people who have been in the business for decades and have never digitized a thing. Um, I always advocate for having the software anyway for small changes and things that you might need to fix. But... It's okay if you're never going to do a very technical file for yourself and maybe you do some simple stuff when you have time and then you don't, you outsource everything else. That's fine. And I used to also, I, I always say this, I'm an outsourcer too. Uh, my favorite thing to outsource were pet portraits or breed animals. Can I do animal work? Yes. It takes a really long time and I don't like doing it, but I had someone who I really believed in who did breed dogs and I would send her everything for that category because she was excellent. She was an absolute master in that category. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. So outsourcing is not a dirty word, even from someone who spent most of their time as an in-house digitizer, you just have to know your market. No, it makes complete sense. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different types of designs that, that are thrown your way by customers. Some mm -hmm. of them are a lot easier than others. So sometimes it's a combination of doing some in-house and outsourcing, uh, which you don't feel comfortable. And if you can find a digitizer that you can develop a relationship directly, someone who is a, they are a person or a group of people who you know who you're working with, and they ask and answer questions well, the kind of questions we were talking about with uh, materials and what you're running, that's a great digitizer and worth paying a little more for. Absolutely. And and again, I I I do pay more than a lot of um, other digitizers charge. I I love the the relationship I have, but just like you said, before you know it, what, 
uh, one out of every five designs, all of a sudden you yeah. start to be like, did they not put a lock stitch in there? Because and and that's why you <laughs> should always test so um, a file oh, before always. you send it there to a product. And, you kind of catch those mistakes. In fact, I'm going to make one other little campaign before we move on. When you test stitch something, don't test stitch it on a stack of stabilizer. Test it on something that is close to the garment you're eventually going to run on. Because yeah. a stack of stabilizer doesn't run like a robe or a towel or a jacket or a hat. And you won't be able to tell what material looks like. So save all of your re rejects and run on every square inch of them and use them to test for similar materials. Similar material yep. structure, similar stabilizer, and similar color contrast, if you have it, is the best way to tell how a design is going to actually look. Not a, not two, two layers of cutaway. That is not going to look like your final garment. They, they, yeah, we've got shirts yep. in here that look like a NASCAR <laughs> jersey. You know, just absolutely logos or one of those yep. uh, golf polos that you see. <laughs> um, so digitizing. So flat yeah. products, Eric. I mean, those are your polos, your sweatshirts, yeah. your jackets, bags, knits. I mean, almost everything that's not a hat is primarily yeah. some flat. Is, is that fair? I think that's fair. Yeah, you may or may not. Sometimes people will talk about flat table versus tubular. All that means is do you have a hoop where your material is hanging off it or are you running on a table? But most people are going to be running tubular, which meaning on a hoop inside of a constructed garment. But I would still consider all of those flats. That's what we would say. It's it really it was hats and flats. Those are the two things that we pretty much run. So yeah. However, you what you have here, not to preempt you leading yep. off here, but structure, the texture, the stretch, and the material thickness does make a difference. So digitizing and stitching for a polo shirt is not going to be like a sweatshirt or a robe or toweling. You are going to have to do different things to those files. So talking to a digitizer about that extremely thick, lofty materials materials that have loops or fur or fiber uh, these things are going to require differences both in the digitizing and in how you uh, apply materials like your stabilizers and your toppers well and and yeah you can't you don't want to just take the same file put it on one of those duck cloth carhartt jackets and then put it on a t-shirt and assume that you're going to yeah. get results both times yeah. Um, in the and, yeah, in the era of tissue tees, we had a, a company who always provided customer supplied garments that even after we stopped taking them, we let them bring them, and they would bring literally a set of jackets all the way front, like all, jackets and everything else, and then suddenly three or four tissue burnout tees, and one of the same logo on them, and it would just destroy them. We would tell them ahead of time, like unless you want to prepare an entirely different setup, because just literally the style of logo, the art itself was too heavy for these things. You couldn't make a version of it that ran nicely. So yes, it does make a difference. <laughs> and in my shop, I pretty much refuse to embroider a t-shirt. I mean, and, and in my experience with, with talking with hundreds of Deco Network users, around half the shops will offer it, half of them won't. So um, yeah, they just know that uh, flats, they, they are digitized differently and your digitizer should be asking you. There are universal kind of like, Sure. There, there strategies that'll kind of work, but is it always going to get you that best result? Maybe not always. Back um, in the day, what they taught us for stock designs or what, what people would kind of aim for is a mildly textured polo shirt. So like a cotton pique or basket weave polo shirt. If you can make it run on that, it'll be a little too heavy, but run okay on t-shirts. It'll be a little too light, but run okay on sweatshirts. So most of the time, that's actually what you're getting is probably a little more density than you want made for the possibility of running about that range. That's what you're going to get from most digitizers if you don't ask, and it's what you'll get out of stock designs that you purchase. So they really will be a little heavy, probably a little too much density in general. But that was kind of always the goal. Thing is, you can refine and get better if you want to. No, it makes sense. And some of those digitizing softwares, if you do get that file, you can, can you decrease that density and, and play yeah. with some of those things like that? Some, some of them you can. I know a uh, software like uh, in Brilliance has a software called a density. <laughs> it's called like the density rescue kit. And it literally does that. It just takes out excessive densities. Uh, other softwares, they reprocess the designs, which can uh, like Wilcom will reprocess it into objects and then you can do make some changes. Um, it does sometimes change textures or patterns in some of the fills, things like that. But it will allow you to do that. The best thing is to not have to do that from a stitch file. Um, the best thing is to tell your digitizer ahead of time. Otherwise, 
anything you do afterwards can work, but is less likely to be the quality it would have been if it was created on purpose for that material. No, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when it comes to hats, I mean, there's there's several different types of hats. You have the unconstruction, unstructured mm -hmm. cotton known as a dad hat. Um, I know yeah. you 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 like the um, some of the mesh the, hats or the military. Yeah, sure. I, you're starting at the racing hats, the real low profile. Yeah, um, yeah. So you have that, and I'll tell you, I'll take a dad cap before a structured six panel. Uh, those six panels can be a nightmare sometimes. Nothing sometimes. is easier in my experience, or per, you know, what I feel is a five panel, like no panel right there. We're like oh, jumping yeah. up and down, like that's going <laughs> to be so much easier to sew. And then you have yeah. like foam trucker hats, which geez, you've got that thick foam and you've got to go into mm -hmm. it. It's just going to look a little bit different. Um, yeah. Are these hats, you know, digitized differently? I mean, I know we have talked about uh, sometimes doing an underlay stitches to help stabilize mm -hmm. the cap. And also, very important, the hoop tension. So when you're hooping a hat, you've got, um, what is it? Oh, look, right behind me. <laughs> you hoop a hat, okay? And when you hoop the hat, there's screws right here. And yeah. you want to adjust it so that when you're stretching over the cap, it, it has good tension. And those mm -hmm. dad caps with the cotton, they're real you know, loose and unstructured. Loose and you need to tighten this up often. And um, I mean, again, you're, it doesn't matter if the digitizing's perfect, using the right needle, all those things, you don't mm -hmm. have good hoop tension, you're gonna potentially not have a great product. Yeah. Um, yeah, that and the use of stabilizers. I mean, it, and people vary on this. I'm going to tell you the, the opinions are not 100% across the board. I use more stabilizer than most people, not more layers. I don't do layers, but I use stabilizer, whereas some people on structured hats say they don't. Um, I tend to, to make sure we have a smooth surface in the back and it doesn't catch up on any sort of parts of the uh, cylinder arm, which is that part where the, where the bobbin rests, uh, that part of the uh, machine. Uh, so I'll use stabilizer there. That and the one thing I'll do on dad hats like that, if they're very loose, very unstructured, really soft and crumply, uh, on a 270 degree cap frame, which is that fully round cap frame, I will run a strip of stabilizer from, from one back post all the way around to the other one so that I have this nice cylinder of stabilizer that's holding up that hat. I mean, we're going to tear that out later anyway. We're going to get rid of some of that. It's not going to stay in the hat. So we can use that full cylinder of stabilizer to hold it up, and then we use underlay to literally... Sew it down. We have to remember our embroidery machines are big glorified robot sewing machines. <laughs> uh, so when we use underlay, we're actually sewing the hat to the stabilizer and it makes it more stable. So we can use special underlay that can stabilize a really uh, very loose or very um, mobile kind of fabric for that hat. So unstructured dad hats, sometimes, yeah, we'll do that. Though the other thing to remember is not all designs are made for all uh, caps. If we use a really tall, really wide design that has a ton of stitches, that's not the best use for a dad hat. And sometimes we have to talk to our customers. And sometimes I'll say this about structured six panels. Not every cap is made the same. If you find one cap that's always breaking needles, but another brand that looks similar doesn't, sell the other one to the customer first. Try and sell that other one. I know sometimes they're going to come in with a brand that they love. Show them the other one and explain that real quickly. Try and get them on that other hat and don't make that the first hat you show just because it's popular. Show an alternative that runs well and tell them why. Um, though there are also things, like you said with the foam trucker, uh, foam hats are going to sink in a little bit. There is almost no machine adjustment that's going to make the design not sink in a little bit, that really squishy foam that's for a foam fronted hat. Know that. And in the, in the best case, Make some samples of these. Whenever you get somebody who orders some in, order a couple extra, make a sample with your own design on it so that you can literally show a customer, this is the kind of result you'll have on a foam front. It really does help for them to visualize it. But yeah, you're totally right. Telling a digitizer what's going on though and saying, hey, yep, I'm on a super structured six panel hat with a big center seam. They can make some adjustments that'll make things better with underlay and with stitch um, the stitch organization, like the the pathing of the stitching, so the direction it moves and and how it layers in the sequence. And they can even do things like uh, run little bridge stitches across those seams if we have to do any vertical detail that might fall in. But we have to know that. So it, really communicating to your digitizer is the, probably the biggest lesson in all of this. Something else, Eric, um, just to point out, and a lot of mm -hmm. customers, you know, a lot of viewers may not know, some of the hats that you see being sold retail they yes. were actually sewn flat 
before the hat mm -hmm. was constructed, right? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it and, and that's got to be easier uh, often to sew something that's flat and two got a couple panels that then the brim is attached to it. Um, so yeah, not especially brim decoration. Everybody mm -hmm. says, how do I sew on the brim? Though you can technically sew through a brim on some machines, and I'm not advocating for this. Oh, I would. It's, it's not always a great plan. Yes, machines will. I've, I've sewn boots, so I've sewn boot leather. You can absolutely. A machine will drive a needle through a lot of things, even things it shouldn't. So <laughs> don't put your hands under there. Trust me. Uh, but sewing through the brim, usually they've made these all. They call it a panel program. The panels are stitched flat, and sometimes even before they're cut and then construct it after the fact. And you'll see most of these hats where it goes way up into the crown, up onto the top, all the way around all sides or anything that's on the brim, almost all of those are done as flat panels uh, and then sewn together, constructed after the fact. That's where you go to a cap company who's gonna make them and it's about your minimums and about what you can get done and lead times. There are companies out there who will do panel program for you, but the guy down the street who, want, you know, when, when Joe's plumber wants five of them, He's going to have to learn that maybe some of that stuff, uh, look into heat press options. You can print on the brim. You can do other things that are, are near to what they want, but isn't sewing through the brim. <laughs> no, make, makes sense. I mean, yep. also just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> next, a lot of things a machine can do. We don't want to do every day. <laughs> when it comes to consumables uh, for yeah. embroidery, I mean, we have backing. We have bobbin thread, we have the top thread. Um, you really wouldn't call a needle a consumable, but you know, it, these materials aren't terribly expensive, um, but you gotta use the right ones. I mean, yes. so stabilizer. And we did a, again, we did a long webinar with Madeira. Madeira is very, very popular uh, consumable for embroidery, uh, thread, bobbins, backing um topping so definitely check out madeira but stabilizer why do we use it well durability it's gonna sure. hold up that embroidery long term it enhances the stitch details um that could be lost it helps this machine so smoothly just like you said eric and like on that hat you know if i'm looking i don't know how well you can see but you have that needle plate and so it's it's not it, that rubbing against the product is not smooth on smooth, but when we use a backing uh, that's a lot smoother than the material it's sewing on, it, it can be um, just better. Um, yeah. Using the right amount of backing. Uh, if yeah. you use uh, too much, it, it's not gonna drape well. You know, you yeah. may not have the best hand, um, the best feel. And if you use too little, you could potentially, you know, sacrifice quality and durability. So you need to find yeah. that right type and the right uh, weight, which we're gonna talk about in this next slide. So there's three primary types of backing. Um, you have your cutaway, and these are typically used on a lot of your flat items like polos, sweatshirts, jackets, and they typically are two to three ounces uh, per sheet. Sometimes you use one, sometimes you use a couple, um, then we have tear away, which is exactly what it sounds like. You are actually going to tear it out, um, after it's been sewn versus a cutaway. You take a pair of scissors to cut as much backing as you can. And you just leave, um, a little bit as close to the ditch as possible. Uh, tear away is often used on something very heavy, like a denim jacket or like hats, um, often made of twill canvas bags. And these range uh, typically one to three ounces. And then we have wash away, which is often also used as a topping. You can use it as backing and topping. Um, these are often used with knits or thin polos or fleece, um, freestanding lace. And in our shop, we have all three types. We have different weights. We have white, we have black. Yeah. And it is very important that you look at um, the design and the fabric that you're sewing on to determine which of these three and how much weight you need for the backing. Is that there's even different, oh sure, there's even different types within these groupings. So know that when we're dealing with like polyester performance wear, there are variations on cutaway, like one, one that's called action back. You may see people call it different things. It's a woven material that have to be used slightly differently. 
Um, those ones, because it's a woven material instead of a wet laid felt like material, which most of these are. Um, the woven materials, one has, you have to have two layers every time. One at the regular 90 degree angle and one set at a 45 degree from it because the woven material has a weak direction in it. The best thing for all of these, listen to your manufacturers. They have guidelines to help you with this stuff and they will provide full guidelines to let you know what they recommend, uh, both as it comes to uh, the material that it should run with and the, the amount of stitching. Remember, embroidery is very physical. Everybody thinks of embroidery as laying on the surface like print does, but it doesn't. We are jamming a needle thousands of times <laughs> through an existing piece of fabric that is opaque since we're wearing it to cover ourselves up. It means that it's fully, it's already fully completely made of thread that blocks everything behind it, meaning we're jamming these wedges of thread through this thing and expecting it to hold all that up. Stabilizer helps to arrest motion. That's why we call it stabilizer. It's not going to move or stretch as much with the stabilizer in place. And it helps to support all that. But remember, we really are, are moving a lot of material around. Um, so the more that we have to do that, the more stitches that are in something, we have to support it. And we have to look at what that's going to do to the fabric of our garment. And part of dealing with that is in the stabilizer and the backing. And and again, like, like you said, Eric, um, whether you use Madeira, whoever, definitely yeah. get... Um, you know, their guide, um, I love how Madeira has, you know, this sample pack and you can really mm -hmm. see, you know, the difference between the waffle and an adhesive one. Um, sure. Yeah, the performance, I mean, it's, it, it can be a little overwhelming. Um, I highly yeah. suggest if you're getting into it to check out um, the other webinar we did with Madeira. Again, yeah. it's longer, but we went through every one of their backings and when you might use each type uh, depending on the design and the fabric that you're sewing on. And um, again, the variables that determine which backing to use uh, first comes down to the fabric. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, that are we going to be using a cutaway, a tearaway, a wash away, a heat away? That's going to come mm -hmm. down to that fabric construction and type. Um, and then secondly, the actual design itself and the density of stitches helps us to determine how much backing we need. Do we need that one ounce? Do we actually need three ounce? Do we need a couple, um, you know, one ounces to get us to two? Yeah. Um, there, there's, and, and again, Madeira does a great job of um, illustrating this um, based on fabric construction. Uh, mm -hmm. A cutaway backing is again, going to be used on loosely woven fabrics, just like my polo, um, you know, we used a cutaway backing here I don't want to just use a tear away just so we don't have to see it. I could, I could sacrifice the durability, um, mm -hmm. which is definitely what we don't want to do. Um, versus again, a uh, tear away backing is typically done on a, a heavier, a woven fabric. Again, like your twill, denim, canvas. Um, so again, look at the product, figure out, you know, is it really heavy construction in which I can get away with the tear away? Or should I use that cutaway? And then again, the design itself, um, if you have a lot of stitch density, like this lion's mane, it's a lot of stitches in a small area, area mm -hmm. we're going to use a heavier weight backing versus this owl example has a lot of open space. Um, mm -hmm. You want to use lighter backing to get the best results. And do notice that's not a size thing. Uh, the owl design as shown here is larger in overall area than the lion design. So it's not just size, it's not just area. I mean, that does have something to do with it. If, we, if we're doing a big jacket back, sometimes you need a little extra stability if the jacket itself is very, uh, you know, if the material is weak or stretches or moves a lot. But yeah, it's really about that density. Remember, we are, we are very much adding a lot of material to the garment and we are definitely disturbing that material a lot by putting those thousands of stitches through it. And, and Eric, and again, I don't want to get too complicated. Anybody yeah. can look at that Madeira one. Sometimes Absolutely. it's a combination of different types of tear away yeah. and cut away or both tear away, cut away and wash away. Um, so we, uh, yeah. our shop, we use a lot of wash away on thin poly polos. Um, mm -hmm. th those just keep getting cheaper and thinner. And what we have found is doing a wash away topping. Uh, actually, I've got a puller right here. And you can see yep. we, we have um, a wash away. So we have thin text here. We sewed yep. it. 
and then we'll get it wet and it'll dissolve and it really helps um, hold that small stitching on a very thin poly polo. And as soon as we started using that topping on there, oh my gosh, it was, it was like we're jumping for joy. Like, huge, oh, this is what we difference. Um, You'd be surprised at a micro scale, even the textures in t-shirt or in a normal polo shirt, those textures can be small enough. When we have stitches that are running around a millimeter, which is kind of that lower end, you'll see those stitches start to sink in or be distorted just by the texture that's on top of the material and laying a piece of, you know, whatever brand of that wash away topping, that thin plastic like wash away on top of it really can just, it holds the stitches while they're forming and keeps them from sinking into the material. So it really can make a difference to the final stitch quality, even after it's rinsed away. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, it's not just backing. I found that the topping yep. is awesome. Um, Anything with texture and small detail, we used wash away a lot. Also get a garment steamer. A garment steamer is your friend for embroidery. Ooh. So it what's a lot for removing that? What's the difference between a garment steamer and a normal steamer? Is there really any difference? Oh, well, I mean, just the ones we use were Jiffy steamers. I, I'm not trying to say hey, another brand won't work, but the ones that have a hand wand that has kind of that T-shaped head on them, uh, we would put these on a steaming. We literally used a frame that looks very much like a Hoopmaster, but it wasn't. It was a, a, a frame like this. We'd throw them on the table with the, that uh, topping still on. And with the steamer, you can kind of start to steam that sheet and you roll it back and forth and it takes all of that wash away material and it softens it. And as you roll that little roll, like a little cigarette of material, it pulls away all the stuff from the inside of the letters in detail, make, making the steaming of the garment and the removal of the wash away one step. So it oh. is something that I really advocate for. If you ever try and get wash away material out of a design that's sticking, more a little bit of moistened wash away material itself either some people make a ball to use or like i said i used to roll the existing sheet over itself with steam it will stick to that wash away and pull it out of small letters and pull it out of the detail so you don't have to fully wet or wash garments people start to get upset about using it because they think they're gonna have to wash something you can steam it and stick it to itself and rip it away and it is it's really kind of nice also if you have what we call hoop burn which is hoop marks around your gar garments where you where the yep. hoops under tension have left a little bit of a scar or a shine a uh, garment steamer will also aid in removing hoop burn so it's one of those things that if you, you don't have one it's a, a wonderful thing to have and honestly uh in our shops especially doing high-end stuff we steamed almost everything no makes complete sense yeah. that my steaming would be often better yeah. than just using a squirt bottle of water and Letting squirt bottle will work though. Squirt bottle will work. I would say there's always room for an upgrade, and that's one of those great upgrades that you don't know until you start working on finishing and, and you know packaging for higher end stuff. It's really great to have because you're also able to you know steam garments, make them look nice. But just that design area, major upgrade to have a steamer to make that easy. Hey, I learned something. <laughs> Not that I know everything, Eric, but but oh, I neither do I. It's dangerous crazy. at at each process. Because I go to enough trade shows and I, I talk yeah. to somebody. Uh, no, great, great uh, point. And steamers are yeah. really inexpensive. Um, mm. so. All right. So that was backing and topping. Let's talk yeah. about Oop. hooping, which is essentially, I mean, in a in what in its simplest form, what is hooping, Eric? It is combining <laughs> the hoop that attaches to the machine to the fabric mm. for its own. Is that good? Yeah. Point? Yeah, and tabletop hooping is how we used to do it. I mean, old school, back in the day, we would do it on a flat table with a regular tension hoop like you're showing here. You put the bottom ring down, you put your stabilizer down, you put your uh, garment over it. So usually it's inside of the garment, and then you're spacing it out, trying to find your centers and make sure it's even and, and aligned correctly to the garment. You press down, and that's how it is. Uh, what I'm going to say is, uh, as we can see in your slides here, using a jig, using a... a um, a hooping station is an absolute game changer for making it correct and consistent like you have here. Uh, the other thing to look at is you can see on the, the image that's on the slide, there are these little peg holes. These are numbered and lettered, and you can make this repeatable from order to order and from you know garment to garment. So it really is very helpful to use a hooping jig like this. Uh, I would say hooping stations are, are the unsung heroes of making this regular and easy. Otherwise, the tabletop, you, what I'll tell you, I've spent so many years picking things up by the shoulder seams and making sure that I was straight. Um, it's a lot easier to do when you have some sort of frame. And we even made our own before uh, the kind of advent of, of things like Hoopmaster. We would make our own jigs. And it's it's a lot nicer to have a multifunction piece like you see here. 
it, it, I, you know, when, again, when I started getting into embroidery, I was, oh, it's, it's like 550 bucks to get the actual station mm -hmm. and like, a hoop. Sure. And you're like, that's a little bit of money. It'll save it you is. so much time and money from mistakes. Um, like you said, Eric, that you're, you're going to put the location left chest. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm a sports fan and I watch a lot of football and baseball. You see a lot of logos embroidered on the left chest and it mm -hmm. is crazy to me how they're all over the place. I mean, I guess there is some yeah. play. Um, it sure. is, it's crazy, but you're actually going to be very consistent in the correct placement because the yeah. jig has letters and numbers. And it'll yep. suggest, hey, use this letter and number for this uh, left chest for this yeah. product size for a unisex men's or then a ladies polo. Because anybody who's never sure. done a ladies polo, oh my gosh, they are very different. Um, and and you want to be in the right uh, location. My employees mm -hmm. give me the thumbs down. He, they they hate doing ladies polos compared to a unisex because it's yeah. just a lot smaller area. But then you're you're not only putting in the right spot, every one of those polos is going to be exactly the same spot because you have yep. to dig to to do it. Um, I cannot speak high enough on the Hoop Master, the Mighty Hoop. There's others out there, but sure. the Hoop Master Mighty Hoop is the most popular from what I know. Um, mm -hmm. not, not cheap. It is expensive. Nope. And they also offer the magnetic hoop. So like Eric was saying, huge old school traditional tabletop hooping and when i do that i had to put the hoop inside obviously i don't have any backing in here mm -hmm. and then i gotta push down and i sometimes the the backing moves or the fabric is in his taunt and it, it's just mm -hmm. a process compared to um magnetic hoops and you could buy the mighty hoop without magnetic hoops personally you can. I, don't know why. I, I i i've seen a lot of shops with it like yeah, there, sure. there has to be a reason. And there's certain products that you just can't do a magnetic hoop with. But certain. magnetic hoops are, I mean, just awesome. And they are very strong. You got to be careful how close to get to my computer. But, I mean, you'll hear. Um, They're strong. You know, and you they will pinch. Arm, you do there. It, yeah. it is so easy, especially with, again, yeah. the mighty, you have to have a jig, essentially, because it holds down the one. It makes it very yeah. easy to put the backing. And then you just mm. push down and it's connected um it, it's so easy to use it's much quicker of a hooping process mm -hmm. um, you're gonna have very even tension for the entire hoop area which is very yeah. important yeah. um you don't always get that with the old school tabletop and big big thing to remember eric um as, as we were talking about the other day you need to be using the smallest hoop size possible for design so if i look at this yeah I'm barely gonna fit in there that yeah. is a lot better than if i were to have used this magnetic hoop and tried to do yeah. that because i'm gonna lose tension yeah. you know if you have a left yeah. and right yes don't do this and think that you're gonna get the best results you need a hoop especially, not on materials that move i mean materials that are going to move in the hoop and especially you're talking about like a polo shirt a performance shirt they have a tendency to shift no matter what we do to them. Um, the smaller hoops just going to arrest that movement and keep you from having problems with like registration or with things like underlay sticking out. The initial stitching of stitches before the top stitching called underlay can sometimes come out because the material is shifted. Um, that happens more when you're when you're not hooped nicely. Uh, and the thing to remember is that even if we are if we're hooping traditionally, traditional tension hoops are great. Use them for a lot of things. Uh, so it's not like you you must go to magnetics. The thing is, those have to be adjusted for the thickness of kind of the stack be, being the uh, the amount of stabilizers you're going to use and the material you're going to use. That tension is going to differ if the materials are of different thicknesses and you have to adjust with the tension screw how tight that's going to be. And you're going to have to keep adjusting and readjusting that, whereas the magnetic hoops are just going to be one and done. Um, and like you said, when we're talking about rectangular hoops, rectangular hoops tend to have weakness and they slide the material can slide along the long sides of, a, of the rectangle, whereas a magnetic hoop has magnets stationed all around the perimeter. And that means even in a rectangular area where you get that full sewing field, you're going to have that even tension. So um, magnetic hoops, once again, it's not inexpensive to switch to all magnetics, especially if you're running multi-head equipment. But in the long term, it is a very useful upgrade. And it's something that even if you're working toward, that can be fine. Like you start out with the hoops that come with the machine, 
and you do the normal style hooping for a while, you make it work, you learn your craft, you know to make it taut, but not stretch so tight that it's rebounding and stretching back down to size after you release it. Uh, if you can do that, but moving to the magnetic hoops will be a lot easier on you, on your hands, on your operators long-term. No, oh, absolutely. And, and don't think that you just, the mighty, the hoop master table frame, that's always the same, but the actual hoop um, is this is what gets changed from manufacturer to manufacturer of the yeah. equipment because that's how it actually locks on here. Um, very easy to swap them out. Um, but talk to your manufacturer when you're looking to buy the equipment. Um, yeah. I don't, I haven't talked to every single one of them, but in like I have a ZSK right behind me. Um, I told him, I don't want your traditional, I want magnetic hoops. And yeah. I only paid the difference. So that's um, nice. yeah. they, they, you know, most of your manufacturers take, will take care of you in that sense. And a lot of them are yeah. dealers uh, of the equipment. So they'll even give you a better price. Um, yeah. I, I definitely just, ask. Yeah. <laughs> and, and don't stretch fabrics unless they're meant to be stretched. Now, now correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm doing like, for example, a bathing suit and I'm going to embroider mm -hmm. it because it's going to be stretched later. Do I want to stretch that, Eric? I threw this There's side, the, pull it on here without your permission. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's the thing I'm going to say. Um, there are debates on this. Uh, the one big one that I have the debate with, and I've actually had this fight out in public, is about knit hats. Uh, knit caps, they look poor when they're laying flat. So when you see them in retail, if you pre-stretch them uh, before you run the design to about the size that most people's heads are, if you pre-stretch them, then when they put back on, when you put them back on, you don't get all the knit lines being warped. Otherwise, what happens if you run them flat without stretching them at all, then your design holds all the area underneath the design together. So that when you put the hat on, then all the other stuff warps. And so the knit lines all go in this little kind of hourglass pattern where right under your design, all the knit is trapped. Mm. Some people don't mind that, some people do. The problem being if it's if it's for like retail sales where it's gonna lay on a shelf it looks terrible because when you yeah. stretch it out and then rebound it, then the design is holding it stretched out, meaning that it looks kind of curly and not that great until it's on someone's head. So the problem that goes on is really about where it's marketed to. Um, I used to stretch them sometimes, especially when I was doing them direct business to business for clients who uh, were going to put these on people directly. They're not gonna put them on a shelf for sale. They don't have to look pretty laying flat. They need to look good on someone's head and be comfortable then I would pre-stretch to kind of a level that's very similar to what it was would be on someone's head. But that was, you know, that made sense for that client. And when somebody was selling them as merch, we had to talk about how that was going to look and whether it was going to stretch nicely. The other thing is if you use stabilizer that you remove entirely, and let's say you have like four letters that are entirely separate from each other, uh, like a lot of fire departments or police departments might have, you put put it on your head after you've done it flat without stretching it and the letters separate and sometimes want to turn a little bit or move depending on how it's on the head and suddenly it looks pretty weird so the other thing to remember is stabilizer holds the design together and in that case you may want to pre-stretch if people don't like how that looks when it starts to stretch or move and or they may want you to use uh stabilizers that stays inside the hat a good thing for knit hats is to use the ones that roll the cuff that are made to have the cuff rolled because then you can hide that stabilizer in that roll and it's not touching someone's head because it's not comfortable. Uh, so yeah, like I said, do you pre-stretch or do you not? It depends on the client and how they're going to use it. They'll have different sensitivities. I will say on swimwear, that's a tough one. Cheerwear, that's a tough one. And I was not an expert in it. It really did depend on the person. Uh, some people really wanted it pre-stretched on bathing stuff. Uh, some people didn't. And for me, the breakdown was always, am I selling it in a store where someone has to look at it flat first? even though sometimes that meant when they stretched it a lot, it didn't look great. Um, for me, I like the pre-stretch, but I'm also trying to think about what it's going to be like on a person, not how it's going to look on a shelf. <laughs> me, I just avoid a product that sounds like a hassle. I, just because you can. <laughs> sometimes. You know, they just go with the simple sometimes. everyday stuff. Is or, or, or print the kinds of inks that stretch and <laughs> do, do that instead. <laughs> yes. Some things okay. are print jobs, even for inverted people. Some things are print jobs. We throw stretch additive in almost every ink um, that we screen print with because yep. it's rare that I don't. What's what's the harm in stretching versus not? Um, yeah, right. Um, embroidery thread. So sure. there are two main types of, well, there's more than just two, but but 
your two most Get popular the two top. are polyester and mm. rayon. And yeah. polyester, which is like the Madeira Poly Neon 40, um, mm. but also comes in that 40 represents the weight, right? Yes. Right, Eric? Yeah, and the, the weight is just generally the thickness of the thread, yes. Thickness of the thread. And I know like the poly neon comes in 40, 60, 75. We're going to talk about that on the next slide mm -hmm. uh, versus rayon. Um, yeah. And I'll be completely honest. When Eric and I were prepping this, I thought poly and rayon. I mean, it's all the same, right? I mean, <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, polyester. Uh, if you have bleach in your detergent, it's not going to bleed the thread and create problems. It's also a very durable thread the polyester mm -hmm. versus the rayon is more of your like home decor. If you were doing um, like drapery or you're doing um, linens or bridal wear, um, mm -hmm. you've got that real detail and you're typically going to dry clean it. You're not going to just take it, throw it into an uh, industrial washer and hope mm -hmm. that it, nothing bad happens. Um, yeah, rayon, rayon has a very lovely sheen. It's very pretty. It lays very nicely, and the tensions are nice. It, it makes a, a it doesn't lash back or stretch back the way that polyester will. But for business to business or any kind of uniforming, polyester is the choice because industrial laundry, a lot of abrasion, polyester is going to hold up where rayon is more likely to break and definitely more likely to bleed. And you can ask me how I know from one of my operators who mixed up a, a large order with half rayon, half poly for a hospital. And let me tell you, that very, very red logo made some very pink doctor's jackets. Uh, it's it's bled right all, all over the place. It looked like a horror show. So, yeah, don't you don't want to run rayon anywhere you're going to see bleach or industrial laundry. So, again, Madeira is uh, by far the most popular. I know that because I've done hundreds of uh, onboarding calls with new Deco yeah. Network users. And I don't care if you're in the U.S., Canada, Australia, U.K., uh, Madeira is the go-to thread 80% of the time in my experience. Um, and it's typically nine out of 10 times. If you're using that, you're doing the poly neon 40. Um, yeah. Their classic 40, is that their rayon? Do you know, Eric? Yes. Okay, yeah. so that's their rayon. That's their rayon. Okay. And I, honestly, and I, I started out my career running almost all rayon. So uh, it's not that it's vastly different. The thread weight makes a lot more difference to how you handle things digitizing and execution wise. It's really about how it's going to perform for your customer. Well, and let's talk about those weights. Yeah. So again, um, poly neon is the most popular from Madeira, who is the most popular thread manufacturer. Again, in my, my experience having hundreds mm -hmm. of conversations, um, the poly neon 40 is kind of the standard go-to um, yeah. that most shops stock. But then the Poly Neon 60, and again, these are all different weights, which essentially are the thickness of the thread. Um, yes. so 40 is the thickness. The 60 is thinner. The it's finer. better for yeah. smaller lettering and details. So um, with like this design, I can't tell you exactly. Yeah, we've got two spools <laughs> on the machine right now. So what yeah. we did was all this white is the 40 and this small lines of text is the 60. So we can yeah. hold better detail. And mm -hmm. it is important that you um, communicate that with the digitizer because yeah. if we need that same density to look good, but they're going to take into account um, what thread you're using. Um, and also you using a different type of needle, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, depending yeah. on that thread weight. And then they also have the Poly Neon 75, uh, which I yeah. guess are very intricate. I Again, I've not had to yeah. use it. Um, I've used 75. I tested it for that for Madeira, actually, when it came out. Um, and what I'll say is the thing about 75 is you have to use a very small needle so that garments that are really hard or big hats, they're heavy. Same thing can happen to the 60. Sometimes it's too much needle deflection. So though we want that finer detail, uh, sometimes it's better to alter the art because some hats or heavy bags or heavy canvas, uh, the the needle for 75, it looks very fine. It looks like 40 weight thread. The needle looks like thread and you can see it deflecting. You can see it bending when it's under tension. So it's, it is the kind of thing where you need to be more careful about it. And it's for specialty uses, whereas the 40 and 60 mostly will hold up to most things. Though be, do be careful with, like I said, very structured hats, uh, very thin needles can be difficult to run, to run well, or not to have them break. 
under extreme conditions. But yeah, uh, generally your the 40 weight is what all, also the thing to think about stock designs. If you get a stock design from somebody, unless they very specifically say it is not for it, those are made with 40 weight thread in mind. Um, yep. If you want to use 60 weight thread, you need a little more density to provide the same coverage because the, th the thread is thinner and that, and density is just a measurement of how close together lines of thread are. So when you say you need more density, that's all you're doing is how close together those lines of thread are, and you're going to need them closer together if they're thinner to provide the same coverage. Well, and and it's a lot. Embroidery is often a lot like printing in that you do a you go through a lot more white than any other color, <laughs> and, 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 they, and black, yeah. navy, and red, and royal. So yes. um, in our shop, we have 90 stock colors of the 40, and then mm -hmm. we have five to 10 spools of the 60. And 80% yeah. of the time we're using white, just like in this yep. example, because it's little text, it's often white. Yep. Not always, but um, important to use that right type of thread because if you're not mm -hmm. able to hold that detail, it, it may be the needle size, it may be the digitizing, it may be mm -hmm. just the weight. All of those are cohesive. Um, have to have them all working together. Well, um, in general, uh, if your material will hold up to it, doesn't have too much texture, you can go about 20 to 25% smaller on text and detail with 68 thread than 40. Just remember that we're still working on fabric. We still have texture and thickness involved. And that can be why you don't always run that 60. But when you've got a fairly smooth material, you're using your toppings correctly, uh, you really can run smaller. And a digitizer will literally make different choices about things like text size based on your ability to run that 60. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, OK, now talking about thread still. So yeah. can't see it, but up here, is where all your top thread is and then down mm -hmm. here we have our bobbin yeah and anyway, i took home ec you know in eighth grade and we didn't go <laughs> on one of these but um yeah, you have your bobbin and sure. bobbin first thing to know is one i and eric you you can know a lot better than i do but sure. uh, magnetic oh my gosh it, i will never <laughs> use anything that's not magnetic and it, it makes it real easy to uh, drop in there. A mistake I made um, initially, uh, I fumble a lot. I've got kind of fat fingers and I would drop the actual case in the ground and uh, mm -hmm. I would essentially bend this up without really knowing it. I mean, there's a little hook in here that can be adjusted to change the tension. Um, mm -hmm. You need to have extra casings. If somebody yeah. does fumble it, it hits the concrete floor pitch it it's not that expensive very very important um to have that correct um yeah. and the tension so it's kind of a battle when we're sewing we have the bobbin tension and we have this top thread tension and mm. they need to be working together um so the bottom should have more tension um the thread weight determines how much tension there should be so if you're using um up here i've got all these knobs that allow us to control how much tension there is up top and you may mm -hmm. have to make adjustments for different weights of thread um it's very important that everything be clean i mean it's kind of yeah. common sense um the cleaner things are the better they're going to be um if you have too little top tension uh it won't trip thread as well i I, trim I, I, yeah trim, uh, trim <laughs> thread as well um sure spell check didn't get trip uh, it's <laughs> bird nest no. uh yeah, so bird nesting anybody who hasn't done this uh you'll be sewing and then all of a sudden you, the, the machine just stops and you pull the product off and there is just a looks like a bird's nest um within the product uh and it's just a nightmare to kind of get yeah. out of there um sometimes it's not possible to recover so you don't want too little obviously up top if you have too much your thread often will just keep breaking um mm -hmm. or you're going to see a loop of thread um on the top and all of a sudden you can kind of like pull that open and then all of a sudden you can keep pulling thread which is also not <laughs> And you'll see bobbin thread come up too. You'll see white flecks or dots because the top is pulling too much tension. Um, a lot of the time it has to do with the bobbin. Most of the time, the first thing to check should be your bobbin and the uh, the bobbin tension spring, that flat little spring that's like a leaf running on the outside. You run in the corner of a business card under it, get out all the lint and gunk, and then start over, rethread your bobbin. 
and a good chunk of the time that's what's going on with tension i still recommend having tension gauges and the good thing once again our wonderful manufacturers have given us measurements to start your tension from is that where you're going to stay forever maybe maybe not but they will tell you hey if you're using polyester 40 this is the proper tension we're looking for and there are guides to help you learn how to tension your machines the thing to understand is uh, ideal tension top thread should be going to the underside like you're seeing here we're looking at the back of an embroidered piece and on a satin a medium width satin stitch like this uh, you're looking for thirds uh, one third color one third bobbin one third color and that's really what we're looking for to get our proper tensioning don't worry if on smaller really small fine columns you're probably going to see almost all uh, top thread that's not a problem they don't all have to be thirds uh, but what you're going to see is many people will give you something called a fox test or there's other tests where you run the word fox in all your different colors and then when you look on the back you get to see it's all in these kind of medium width satin stitches if you look on the back it'll show you all those tensions and it means that in all directions you're getting that right tension and everything should look like these thirds that we're talking about uh that's the thing to realize uh, honestly it, it is this tug of war because we're really we're there are two loops of thread pulling against each other and for the purpose of, of embroidery for sewing you want that tension right in the middle of the fabric for embroidery we want that top thread to go under so we get full color all the way to the back so that's really what we're looking for. And, and you're absolutely right. You can have problems with intermittent tension and looping because your case is out of round and the sides of your bobbin are hitting where it's bent. Uh, it's also a really great reason, uh, aside just from operator comfort, to put anti-stress mats in front of your machines. Because <laughs> sometimes you drop the bobbin, you get yes. a lucky, lucky hit. That. It yeah. lands on the anti-stress mat and you don't have to throw it out. But if you're seeing weird tension problems, by all means, take a look at that bobbin. Also, if you just have a lot of intermittent problems, especially if you aren't using the magnetics, you have the cardboard side bobbins and they're uneven, pitch the bobbin, put it in a new case, see if it still happens. Yes, it's a cost, but it's a minor cost and it's much better than the thousands and thousands of stitches that you'd be messing up <laughs> down the road. So every once in a good long while, you can have a weird bobbin, you can have a bent case, and it's just good to keep those things clean and maintained. One thing I don't have a slide for, and this helps us when we have yeah. that looping or the bobbin uh, color mm -hmm. coming up. Thread, thread yeah. pen. Oh my gosh, these will <laughs> I mean, it's cheating, but it'll help you because uh, if you know you're doing a black design and all of a sudden you've got white bobbin thread coming up, you're like, that's not good. All Here's right. what I'll say: you, you you shouldn't be coloring everything. Don't recolor an entire letter. But if you have a dot and you're throwing away a garment over a dot or two dots of white bobbin coming up, especially during the lock stitch, don't. Indelible markers are your friend, and I'm here as an experienced embroiderer to say, absolutely, a set of a large colored set, especially a wide range of colors. A little dot is good. Touch it for the least amount of time you can, because that ink migrates and don't touch the garment. If you're coloring everything, there's a problem with your tension, with your machine, with your digitizing. If you have a dot here or there, don't throw the garment away. It's okay to do that. <laughs> hit, it, hit it with a little bit of what we call the liquid trim, you know, and let it and let it be okay. <laughs> yep. make, makes sense. Um, we did yep. find those to be a lifesaver sometimes, because sometimes, again, you're going on a very, we we embroider typically much more expensive items than what we print. Yes. You know, all those cost yes. more than a t-shirt. You don't want to just pitch they it. Do. You want to try to um, fix it sometimes. Um, yeah. Okay. So we have the thread. Um, sure. And how that thread actually is sewn is using a needle. So yeah. um, needles, I'll hold up this one. Um, you can see on here, or I could just, you know, take us to the slide that shows it. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> You have different needle sizes and you have different needle points. And what did I know when I first bought my machine? You know, just throw a needle in there and just start sewing. It'll work. No. Uh, it's just one more variable. Get right. You've got to be looking at your thread weight, uh, the, the design itself. So the needle point, and we have another slide here in just a second. Um, sure. You have sharper, you have rounder. Which needle point you use is determined by the fabric that is being sewn um, yes. versus the needle size. So how large it is, is going to come down to the embroidery thread. Are you using a 40 weight, that's 60 weight, that's 75 weight? Um, yeah. Very important. And again, you could see on the illustration on the right, um, you could see the needle size, uh, the needle point, and 
What's the needle system? Do you, do you know what that it, is? It, the, there's different constructions in the needle system. Most of us are not going to be worried too much about that because there's only a couple of systems we're usually using. Also, there are needles for all manner of different kinds of sewing. So it's good to just start out saying, yes, we want to do embroidery. And generally, if you're talking with your machine manufacturer, they're going to recommend it. I mean, a lot of people are using the Grossbacker at DBX K5 is very common. Uh, there's only a couple of common systems. and It depends on, there's things like the geometry of the shank and the blade and all of that, which you don't necessarily need to know. Most of the time, you're going to be recommended a needle system that's working for you. And what's more important to us is the, the uh, needle point geometry, which is more about, is it a ball point or a sharp? or a transitional or a regular point. We'll get into that in the next slide. Well, and very important that the needle be sharp. I mean, needles are not expensive. I mean, really, none of the consumables, and again, I wouldn't consider this a consumable because it's not used in the final product. Um, they are cheap. Um, if you're having problems, if, if you sew a design and the next one, you know, no tensions change or anything, and you're not getting as good of results or threads breaking, replace the needle um yeah yeah it, it's it's very important don't do what i did one time and i kept breaking it <laughs> you know what i did i stood kind of close to the machine and i stared at it and then yeah. the needle broke and hit me right below the eye and i'm like oh my that could have been bad uh if that needle could break don't don't keep yourself away from the machine uh because you never know what could happen and Dumb like so, me. As I said to say, they, they, get, they get bent over. On a micro scale, the tip can bend over and develop little hooks and burrs. Uh, if you're seeing fraying and breaking, if you're seeing, uh, you may even see uh, kind of cutting, like even you're using a ballpoint, if it's bent or broken or, or rough, it'll start to kind of tear up the edges around small letters on certain uh, garments where the material is kind of fragile. Throw that needle, dump it. Uh, people will tell you different measurements or different amounts of time. Uh, to be honest, in a large production shop, most of the time what you're doing is you're running great guns. And if anything looks weird, you're like, hey, pitch the needle. You know, if anything looks weird, starts running bad, it's a good time to do it. No, it makes, makes sense. <laughs> it's, it's not it should it's have been earlier, but if you miss, if you don't do it in time and you, you have gotten yourself running too long and you're starting to have problems, it's an easy consumable to let go of, especially if you switch to another needle with the same part of the design and it doesn't have problems, then by all means, <laughs> swap that needle out. Well, what, what, what happens, at least in our shop, because mm -hmm. I, I didn't talk to Eric before we started sewing, <laughs> we, we went from this RG and ended up becoming mm -hmm. an FG because, in a way, sure. it got rounded. <laughs> yeah, it rounds it over. We're wondering, you know, why are we not holding that fine stitch anymore? It is good. Yeah, yeah. Well, needle didn't break. Why do we need to replace it? <laughs> you need to replace the dang thing. Um, yeah, for sure. Um. So what is our everyday needle? Is it is it our go-to needle often, this RG round? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, and here's what I'll say. Um, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter, but if you're running on stuff that is really rough, so yeah, we're talking about that Carhartt jacket with that coarse material, that cotton duck, a sharp, an R, a true sharp needle really can make a difference to how that thing's going to sew. Uh, and if we're on really loose knitwear, something that looks like a knitted sweater, Maybe we want to use an FG or an FFG, a ballpoint, in order to let the material go around. Instead of piercing right through that yarn, we want the yarn to be on either side. We want it to move the yarn out of the way. But for most of what we do, if we look at that big standard universal group, yeah. most woven materials, most hats, most jersey knits, so that's a t-shirt is a jersey knit, most polo shirts, uh, what we found is the RG tip just kind of did everything. And now if you occasionally ran a jacket on it, maybe you didn't get the finest detail because it wasn't splitting through the, the core of those um, pieces. You get some needle deflection. Sometimes a satin stitch that was on an angle would have some little bits of stair stepping on the edge. But then we can run a sharp when we're doing something extreme. Most of the time for woven and knits that are in that category of most of what we wear, the RG tip that geometry is going to be good that's going to hold up and not going to tear anything up it's not going to cut things and it's also not going to um wander a lot from side to side of the fibers in the fabric so rg tip i will be honest for 40 weight thread 7511 size rg tip holds up to a lot 
You get finer detail from a slightly smaller needle. Certainly you can go slightly smaller if you're usually doing things that aren't complicated jackets that don't have big, thick seam stuff like that. You can go slightly smaller, but for the shops I've run when we're doing production day in, day out, without swapping a lot of the times, without swapping different needles, that RG tip just did the job. Um, certainly, if you're going to run tons of canvas, of bags, Carhartt jackets specifically, or any other cotton duck work jackets, having sharps is important. Um, those are the two ones that we usually went back and forth between. And some hats, when they're really rough, when the interior uh, support material or buckram was really tough, sometimes sharps was how we handled that. It would punch through it. It's not the best for using a ton of detail, but sharps were more, more likely to be something we'd switch to. And frankly, we just, most of the shops I worked in didn't do a ton of super loose knitwear uh, where we used super bowel points like the FG. RG was pretty passable for most stuff we did. Doesn't mean don't get the others. It does mean for most things that aren't extreme, you're going to get a pretty good result provided you're not trying to push the smallest, smallest text or the, you know, the most detail on the heaviest, coarsest materials. Um, Eric, something I thought when I was buying an embroidered machine, I was thinking, mm -hmm. well, you get more needles so you can sew more colors. Mm. Not necessarily. You know, I have an 18 yeah. needle here on the Sprint 7. Yeah. I, it's so rare we sew more than six, eight colors. I mean, I hate yeah, those. Yeah, that's true. Colors, honest, because we have this run them all. So what, sure. when you have more needles, what you're able to do is you're able to set up your most common colors for like the first six, yep. so, you know, your black, your white, your red, your navy, your royal, although there's many shades of everything outside of sure. black and white. Um, but also we have different um, thread weights and different yes. needle sizes. So we always have a white with the poly neon 40, and then we have a white with the poly neon 60. And Absolutely. the it goes with both so never make the assumption that more needles is meant for more colors it means you have less thread changes potentially and you can sew that same color uh differently with different threads and different needles it's a hundred percent how i tell people to set up their multi-needle machines is that one or two of those needles should probably be on 60 weight if you're doing fine text a lot and i'd say this too if it turns out that your particular business is different and let's say uh you do a lot of polo shirts and then you do a lot of dog collars why not set up a couple of needles with your most popular colors on them with heavy sharps with you know 90 sharps and leave those on it depends on your market but for most business to business absolutely right set up 40s with your basic colors and then leave at least a couple of needles for setting up for 68 threads so the thinner needle and uh, the different geometry sometimes makes sense it works all right, so again, the embroidery needle size is determined by the thread size slash type. Um, yep. Madeira has this uh, guide um, that shows you which uh, types of their threads can be used with the different, um, their different threads with their different size needles, sorry. And, yeah. and like I pointed out, uh, Eric, 7511 is kind of the go-to. Um, pretty you common, see, pretty common. Very, yeah commonly used with the poly neon 40. Um, very mm -hmm. important that you're using the right size needle, the right type. Um, this has nothing to do with needles, but something that you, essentially machine maintenance comes down to oiling, right, Eric? <laughs> yeah. You need to have uh, an oil. Uh, we do a drop on the uh, casing or the hook. I, I don't know the technical term, uh, Eric, but very yeah. important that you keep your machine looped up, um, yep. snips. So yes. you're going to be snipping a thread um, from the back. A lot of the times, uh, sometimes you have a loop in the front that you need to uh, get. Snips mm -hmm. are very cheap. Um, we are aggressive about pitching them because again, they're, I mean, they're very inexpensive, like $2. Mm -hmm. uh, I could sharpen them, but it's cheaper to just replace them. Um, those are another thing that if you drop the tips break or round off, uh, just pitch them. If the tips are broken on your snips, pitch them because a fine tip is how you get in between things, especially if you do need to trim. Let's say that something is uh, you don't want to have a, a really extreme tie off and a trim on the machine or you don't want to slow the machine down for it. If you happen to have more hands than you have machine heads, sometimes you just trim things off machine. Uh, nice sharp snips are very important. And those flat ones like you use, they really work quite well. Well, and I've also, I haven't, but it always mm. is the most expensive product that you pierce with these things. <laughs> no, they are blades. 
flat to, to the garden. Yeah, uh, ruin a product <laughs> if you're not careful because you go Don't right trim like this. Trim like this. Blades flat to the garment. Keep them flat. Don't put your points down because you put your points down, you're going to cut holes. <laughs> yeah. I've trained a lot of trimmers where I walk up and see them doing the the peck method of trimming down toward the garment. I'm like, no. <laughs> Bring this down flat. Breakers that we've learned. Yes. Like, breakers yeah. take so little to just... Um, and a yeah. hole in like nylon windbreakers, w any sort of waterproof materials, a hole in that is a hole forever. A hole in leather is a hole forever. <laughs> yep. So yeah, be careful with those. And also with stitching, make sure you're, you're in shape. You got your needles right and everything's right in the world before you start stitching on windbreakers. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Last variable to get right. Sure, sure. The sewing speed. And yeah. um, we're going to be at the Long Beach show. Um, yeah. I, I love going to shows and there are always booths that like to talk about, look how fast this thing can sew. And it, it, they sewing at a quicker speed, but constantly having thread breaks does not help you. Um, yeah. so if you start hearing this thing sews at 2000, uh, you know, stitches per minute. Yeah. But how often it, is it stopping? Um, yeah. And it, it's faster doesn't mean always better by any means. It means faster is what faster yeah. means. Um, in our experience, hats typically sew slower than flats. I mean, we're rotating. We, we often slow it down. We get better results. The other thing, Eric, and I'm not saying this is what everybody's worried about. These mm -hmm. machines are loud. And are. if yeah. you're at an event and you don't want it to be as loud, slow the machine down. I mean, it's yeah. amazing what a couple hundred stitches per minute slowing down will quiet um, some of the loudness. Um, so too fast, you'll often lose quality. The thread can't relax in the fabric. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. it's and and I think Eric, you've even said you've ran some so fast sometimes the needle's getting warm and it's starting to heat the thread. Um, yeah, it certainly feels that way. You certainly, get more thread breaks. Um, if you're running extremely fast or the other thing to remember is you got to take care of your thread. We didn't really say this, but I know in the, in the climate I'm in, in New Mexico, it's very dry and dusty. We keep all of our threads in sealed containers that are clear so we can see them, but we keep them sealed and out of UV. So they're not in front of a window because that eventually will damage thread. And then you'll find old thread. People will go and buy thread from somebody's shop that's closing and they buy just these boxes of thread for no money. But if you pick it up and you just pull, you'll do a little pull test and it snaps really easily. Um, older thread, threads that have been stored in too much or too little humidity can sometimes become very friable. They break very easily. Uh, so th something to kind of think about is like, you know, keep your thread nice and know that if you have thread, thinner threads too, if they're a little more likely to snap, the faster you run them, they're more likely to be on the edge of that tension. Also more tension on the designs, uh, more speed means more of that pull and push distortion we talked about earlier, the narrowing of the columns, which also means if a design doesn't have a lot of compensation built into it, um, you'll have like borders will start to miss their edges. You'll have outlines on things that miss their marks if you go above certain speeds. Just, just let people know it's like, hey, yes, you can do things to adjust for that, but most of your designs, the people are not expecting you to be on a machine running at, at mass incredible speeds. They're expecting a more reasonable pace. Yeah, and, and my experience, it's often around 1,200. Um, and, and again, we, we there's two ways yeah. to call it. It depends so on the machine. Different, you know, <laughs> we call it revolutions per minute or they call it stitches per minute. They're, they're one and the same, right? Right, Eric? Yeah, Events, yeah. yeah um, generally. So it, yeah, the, when we're making a revolution with the drive, we're doing a stitch cycle. So yeah. Um, and, and the thing to think about with it, it's it, someone will tell you a number and say it's right. If you go purchase a used late 90s machine that's been in service for a long time and try and run it at 1200, even if, if that machine even is specced to go up to 1200, that's not going to run the same way as a brand new machine. The technology has changed and honestly, the parts are worn down. If you have an older machine, the likelihood is you're not going to run a thousand all the time. You very likely will be running things at, at 900, 800. And if you have a prosumer or a home style machine, some of them don't go to the speeds that commercials do. Um, it doesn't necessarily make them bad. It does mean you have to account for what your real speed is when you're starting to price things out and get deeper into what it costs for you to run things. Time studies are great uh, to let you know what's really realistic, especially because you do need to include things like your hoop time and your prep time in in the, in the, the overall uh, calculation of what it costs for you to get a garment out the door. Um, it's well worth knowing that 
this is not universal. And also just, as you said earlier, just because a machine can go 2000, doesn't mean that a super dense, heavy design that's going on a material that stretches a little bit should be run at that speed. And we can expect that the results will be the same if we ran a little slower. I mean, mostly we're adjusting different things because you can do things like I'm running a little less stabilizer, but I'm running a little slower so I don't cause the distortion because I want a real soft hand. You can kind of balance all these things. How much density I'm putting together, how much, you know, how much I'm running that machine fast, what stabilizers on it and hoop tension, things like that. You can balance things out to get a particular result, but it's worth understanding. Like you said, um, sometimes, Running at a more balanced speed, especially if you do have maybe a design that's not quite up to snuff, will cause it to not make rejects. And the most expensive thing we can do is lose the whole garment. I mean, that's that's the hard part. It's like losing time is is an important thing over over time, and a lot of that's efficiency. Same thing with digitizers; if they're not efficient about movement, they do too many trims, they go back and forth between colors too many times. That time loss is meaningful. But if you find yourself having to toss garments because you're pulling holes in them, small letters, you can pull eyelets in little O's and E's. They will literally just completely hollow out the inside of the letter sometimes under high tension at speed. Uh, it's worth knowing that cranking that down and using the right needles and using the right materials can keep more of the garments going out to the customer and less out of your bin. And and typically <laughs> you know, your, your specialty threads, if it's metallic, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Sound a little differently, and if you're doing puff, you know, 3D, yeah. you're often slowing that way down. Um, well, and, and often they have really wide columns, and the machine over a certain width will slow itself down for the really wide satin stitch columns. You'll hear it do a double cycle, and it's very slow. We, the joke we always say is it's the kachunk, because suddenly the machine goes from tap 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 to kachunk kachunk kachunk. <laughs> it slows itself down because that really long stitch is just not a good idea. You don't want to whip that frame back and forth that fast. And is as, that we, a, as we know. Is that, is that mm -hmm. how it's controlled? Yeah, it's the width of that satin stitch will do that. So <laughs> there's a, a limit, the, that over said limit, um, you will get that that real long cycle. A 12 point, it depends on the machine, 12 point odd <laughs> centimeter or millimeters. So, you know, 1.2 centimeters, 1.4 centimeters, plus, so 12.4 mils around in there, 12.6, you'll get past that, you get that really super slow stitch. It can be different on machines, uh, but there is kind of a limit to that stitch length before you get that super slow stitch. Now, there's also just, uh, there are, there's, there's ramping tables inside of machines that slow things down for just longer and shorter stitches that are in between those sizes, but after that real long stitch, if you're 14 millimeters, you're definitely going to hear that super slow, long stitch. And the, the, when people encounter it the most, really big monograms on stuff, sometimes, rarely, most times foam. It's the big unbroken satins that people like for real big foam letters that tend to be where you encounter that super slow stitch. But yeah, <laughs> that's not, and that has nothing to do with your dial because your machine will just enforce that It'll over enforce. a certain length. It'll just do it. But uh, other than that, what you can adjust with your own uh, your own dials, with your own uh, with your own settings in your head unit, that stuff. Like I said, yes, you can run up to the max the machine can do, but be aware the troubles increase. Any weakness in your process will reveal itself at top speed. <laughs> Makes sense. Weakness in the material, weakness in the process, weakness in the file will reveal itself if you're going as fast as you can. Eric, as we've covered. There are so many variables to get right, just like any decoration process, only changing one variable at a time. You don't want to just go too crazy. Good thing. So again, um, starts with digitizing. Yep. Uh, once you have the digitized file, you can, you really should do a test. So on fabric yeah, that is very totally. similar uh, and, and feel very similar color. Uh, mm. Every time we get a new job, uh, we always do a test so send it to the customer just because it looked a certain yep. way it was you know digitally created doesn't mean it can be sewed exactly the same way and there's a lot of things i can't do um so yeah. it has to be changed uh very important they use the right stabilizer and backing uh when you hoop again life gets easier when you're using a jig and magnetic hoops mm -hmm. um, highly suggest uh, looking at the hoop master and mighty hoop uh Thread types and weight is very important for uh, getting the fine detail and uh, the stitch density. 
uh, along with the thread tension, needle type, and sizes that's all going to uh, work together to um, optimally create a good quality uh, finished product or something that's subpar because you're not using uh, one of these correct variables correctly. And then lastly, the actual speed uh, can also uh, influence the final quality. Eric, we failed to uh, go shorter than, again, an hour and 45 minutes like I did last I week. We would. But I, don't, I don't know how we could do it any quicker. Again, I hope that this has been very helpful for our attendees. Again, we're going to be uh, always putting our webinars on YouTube. Uh, we're trying to bring trade shows uh, to anybody who can't attend them. Again, Long yeah. Beach is coming up in January. It is the best show of the year for apparel decorators. Um, and, and these are the things that you learn when you're walking around the show, you're talking with the manufacturers of equipment or the uh, resellers, distributors, and you're attending classes like what Eric uh, hosts at, at the shows. Um, if you are going and you're signing up for seminars, I highly suggest you always look at Eric's. Um, I Thank always you. see there, Eric, and um, Eric's written a lot of great education uh, articles for different magazines. Um, you have your own website. Um, uh, let us know a little bit about that, Eric, and what you do every sure. Friday, and uh, we'll wrap yeah. this up. Yeah, uh, every Friday I host a show called The Take Up. It's a live show, very much like this one, where I generally tend to cover a topic in some detail and I'll answer some live questions. Mostly it's about a topic, but it's just me doing the talking head thing mostly. I will show some visual examples and show some things there. Uh, and uh, I'll often show not only the things that you need to know like this in a general fashion, but sometimes go into uh, more detail about things like digitizing and materials and, and that sort of thing. So that's that's the take up. You can find it on ericcampbell.com. Uh, that little funny H in my name makes me real searchable. And go up to the top of that website and then there's a tab that says the take up and you'll see the latest one, including uh, a playlist that has over 170 odd uh, episodes that I've done so far of this. During, started that right around the beginning of the pandemic to kind of keep people sharp and keep people working in and going ahead with that. And also uh, you'll hear me talk about things like those classes. I am teaching a couple classes at Long Beach and you'll see me at the DAX shows this year. So if the, if you wanna learn more stuff like this, uh, certainly I and my compatriots are always out there teaching at the trade shows and, and always happy to have you out. And at different levels, right? Like today's yeah. was more of a beginner level, but you've done totally. a lot of advanced stuff. So if you are striving, you know, to be a great embroiderer and, and put out you know, very difficult, uh, high quality products that, that a lot of shops just don't have the skill set for. Eric um, is the guru. Um, so <laughs> I can't uh, thank you enough, Eric, for participating today. Um, we definitely hope to have you back for another webinar. For sure. And, um, I can't wait to uh, buy you a beer or cocktail or something at uh, the Long Beach show. Uh, in January. And if you can, uh, I highly suggest anybody, there's just nothing like that Long Beach show. Um, it's a good show. Is, is, uh, January, I believe, 20th is when it starts uh, this next year. So thank you again so much, Eric, and um, have a nice holiday. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye, guys.